This is Jordan Poyer, safety for the Buffalo Bills, and you are now listening to Cover One Buffalo Podcast. Let's go. Good evening, and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your regular partners in crime, Greg Thompson and Aaron Quinn. Aaron, how are we doing? I'm all messed up, man. The short weeks got me scrambling around. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but I'm all messed up. It, it's good to see you, but I feel like I just saw you. Yeah, well, you did, so that that's part yeah. of the reason. Um, and tonight, we are joined by a special guest that many of you know from his previous travails with ESPN, with the Buffalo News, and now with The Athletic and 1270 The Fan, our very own Tim Graham. Tim, how are we doing? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, guys. I've, I've been looking forward to it. No, we, we appreciate it very, very much. Uh, for everybody listening, you know, t- take a listen wherever you're at. Give us a like, give us a rating, give us a review. Tell a friend about what's going on here. Uh, come on o- over and join us at CoverOne.net and all the things that we have going on there. Uh, the, our favorite part is the, the premium subscribers and our uh, Slack channel, being able to listen to everything that we have going on and, and having a little bit of, uh, you know, reprieve from the normal social media mess that's going on here. Uh, but uh, come on in and join us and have some fun. Um, Aaron, how, how are we doing so far this week as you, you touched on getting into this weird crunch time frame? Yeah, well, and I wanted to actually kick this off to Tim while we got him on here because I, I'm pretty hard on the media on Twitter if you follow me. Whoever's out there on the media, I give them a hard time. But this week I feel bad specifically for for all of you guys in the media, Tim. And I know that you've done Thursday the Thursday primetime game, but this week a little bit different with doing Thanksgiving game. I don't know how many in your career they part of. I wanted to know, like we getting into that when I was when I break down the things, when we get the stats together. How is this mess? What's it like on mind of being a B guy and leaving everything behind eight times a year and, and going and, and working all over the place? Can you come look like don't cry for me western uh, it is, <laughs> it is, it is, but in any in any format is listening to the media complain about travel about uh airline delays um about missing a flight because look nobody's going to be sympathetic towards that nobody feels sorry for reporters and so many people would love to do what we do uh, to be trapped in an airport, whatever. No, no, everybody just rolls their eyes. So uh, I don't think anybody really gives a damn what, uh, how this affects. It, I mean, just like you guys were saying, it feels like a different day of the week. Uh, I was out at uh, one of those drives in the locker room, and it was, from a media standpoint, like a Wednesday uh, in terms of getting news conference room, um, at the lectern uh, out in the field house where uh, Terrell, uh, uh, Tremaine Edmonds and uh, Josh Allen. And so it felt very much like Wednesday. And usually on that day, I'm constantly looking at my phone to see what time it is because I have to get to the radio station. And I, kept, I probably did that four or five times today. About, well, I got <laughs> for me to go. And that's like, nope, I don't have to go anywhere today. Um, it's... Uh, I, I don't think I've covered a Thanksgiving game before, and the only reason I, I'm not sure is because my three years at ESPN covering the AFC East is a bit of a blur, and I did have to cover, you know, pretty much then, as, as you guys can imagine, I was covering the Jets or the Patriots every week, and I was based in South Florida for part of that. So if the Patriots played on Thanksgiving or the Jets, I'd have to go back and look, Um but I covered so many Sunday night games, Monday night games. There were times when I would cover uh, three different games. I would cover a Thursday night game, a, mon- a game on Sunday, and a game on Monday night. And so it, it got to be, yeah, ESPN it was a little easier too because it was more about the games. Um, whereas when you're covering a team on a, a single team, whether it be on a beat or in my role as a, as a features writer slash columnist, uh, you do get into a rhythm of a season and the NFL is such a, it, it's, that's one of the great things about covering the NFL is, you know, exactly what you're going to be doing on a regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you could pick the day. And if it's not a Thursday or a Monday game, you know exactly what you're going to be doing on that given day. You can make plans, whether it be doctor's appointments or stuff with your family. 
Right. So, um, so yeah, that is, so, th- so this is one, one game out of the season where you have to do it a little bit differently and uh, it'll be fine. Then we get a long weekend. Yeah. And a little weird being away from the, the family for Thanksgiving for you, or are you guys going to do something uh, kind of down there collectively as the, the group? of? No, I've never really been a big Thanksgiving guy. It's yeah. my family's pretty close. And Thanksgiving to me was just one more reason to get together, but this time you got to get dressed up. Uh, and no other time do we get dressed up, but this time we're going to get dressed up. And there's just added stress of everything needing to be ready, and you got to yeah. make sure that you bring this and don't forget that. Um, so yeah, to me it was always just kind of like a disingenuous. Uh, I don't know. It just and, and the kids never liked it. And I'm talking about when I was a kid, or now that I'm a parent, the kids are always a little stressed out and bored, tugging at your shirt. Oh, when's it, when are we going to leave? <laughs> or if you're hosting it, when are all these people going to leave? Yeah. Uh, as opposed to Christmas, it's the same crew, but everybody's got something to play with. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, I'm not, a nice little break. I, I just here, uh, I can do without it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny, it, you know, being into that rhythm of things. It's funny how often you take things like that for granted. And then all of a sudden the, the big moment comes and you're like, Oh God, I can't wait for this to be over. <laughs> we did all this planning and preparation. Like, all right, get out of my house. Everybody I'm, out of the house. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, you know, that's the same sentiment. And here's another one where the fan is going to, is not going to care because they would love to be able to do this. But uh, every year when it comes around, when, again, when I was at ESPN being a national company, same thing with the athletic, um, you know, when you're at the Buffalo news, it's a little bit different. Uh, but there are some, when you're at a national company that sends a lot of people to the Super Bowl, you wonder if you're going to be on the team that covers the Super Bowl that year. And um, if your team's not in it, of course. And it's always an honor to be chosen to go. And there are times when it's, you know, hey, you're not going this year because it's so-and-so's turn. And I feel like, oh, damn it, I, I wanted to go. But then the years I do get picked, I don't like it. So, <laughs> what? Because once you've covered a couple of them, and unless it's a great city like New Orleans, uh, but, you know, last year was Atlanta and it was freezing cold. Uh, you know, so, when it was in New York, uh, Minneapolis, uh, and then sometimes you get picked and it's an honor to go, but it is a drag because it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of sitting on shuttle buses. And, and, and again, this is where nobody wants to hear me bitch, but <laughs> it's the same sentiment of you, you like the idea of it until you have to do it. And then once you do it, you're like, yeah, let's get this over with. And let's just get me home next year. I hope I don't get picked. <laughs> That's too funny. Now, it, well, I mean, it, it kind of goes into our, our next topic here and that, that creature of habit idea. And the fact that, you know, Bill's fans kind of have an, an aura about them that we've, we've galvanized ourselves to being the underdog. So many of the stories you always hear about that mentality, the blue collar, the grittiness, all the, the cliches, and that part of that's real. Part of that comes from a sense of, well, they're never going to talk about us anyway. So I'd rather try to find a way to, to weaponize that or to use that to to be something and I think Sean McDermott's played into that a bit with the nobody respects us everybody's you know against us uh, you know chips on shoulders and everything that goes along there and that you know I had put something out there this week that got a lot of attention in that I, I think there's a possibility that this game is one of those games that could genuinely alter national perception in that coming in eight and three Every single game, Sunday at 1 o'clock, probably one of the least viewed teams nationally of any team in the league, all of a sudden in Jerry World against America's team, if they somehow were able to pull this off, I don't know how Bills fans would even process the idea of maybe getting recognition nationally. And the the psyche of Bills fans interests me in how much interaction you get and feedback you get. How do you think it would come across in, in trying to pivot into that mindset? I think uh, Bills fans more than most, based on my experience covering uh, four different teams over the years and and having covered the NFL for 15 years or what it's been, uh, Bills fans most crave fault or just that, or or that the Bills fans are any uh, needier or desperate than other fans uh, inherently. But when their team hasn't given them much to be relevant or feel relevant uh, through, then I think it does, it, it, it's fun to be relevant. I mean, just remember, I mean, this is clearly anecdotal, but just remember 
I don't know what year it was, uh, Kiko Alonso's rookie season, whatever year that was, 2012, what is that? Um, when you had uh, people doing sexual favors in parking lots for a <laughs> Kiko Alonso jersey, when you had people uh, filling in Kiko Alonso's name on as the write-in. As- Thanks again, Tim. Just getting back into to what you were talking about and the relevancy of of the team and and kind of the fragile psyche of of Bills fans and and that yearning for validation. Uh, you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you kind of continue on where you were. Yeah, I think that it's uh, it's fun to be relevant and it's fun to be mentioned on ESPN and NFL Network and have uh, inside the NFL on Showtime talking about your team or. Uh, hearing an analysis from Tony Dungy on the pregame of Sunday Night Football, uh, it, whether you like him or, or loathe him, uh, Stephen A. Smith uh, putting your team in the top five uh, of his power rankings. Uh, yeah, I think Bills fans get a charge out of that uh, because it ha- it just hasn't been there for so long. It, it's new. It's exciting. It's a breath of fresh air to be considered good again. So I don't I don't buy that Bills fans – prefer being the underdog. I think we, uh, we as Western New Yorkers and the inferiority complex that you have of not being New York and not being Toronto and all the rust belt elements and uh, those things as they're falling by the wayside and, and development and uh, uh, jobs and all these different uh, positive things that have been happening around Western New York over the past few years, uh, canal side and, businesses and uh, I do think that still it's there's uh, yeah it's fun to be the underdog or to uh, embrace it because you really have no choice and it, it's a it bands everybody together it's a bonding uh, exercise almost uh, to say hey we've weathered this as Bills fans but uh, let's face it uh, that's not going to be worth it unless there's a payoff at some point and to get to the payoff uh, before you get to championship or uh, the validation that you're talking about, you need to be relevant. And so relevancy is a great sign that the bills are heading in the right direction. I got a question for you. Cause you're around these guys, you've been around professional athletes for a long time. And obviously they're always going to talk kindly about Buffalo and about the fan base. That's just kind of PR standard all around the league. You're going to get some of that. Uh, I think this team probably more than any, because they have a lot of the guys that were part of ending the drought. Mike Hyde brought it up the other day. Do you think that they understand how much that thirst for relevancy is in Western New York? You know, they get uh, treated well all around town, no matter whether they're winning or losing, they're superstars and all that. But do you think they understand the amount of pressure and do they feel it at all? Or is it just another day at the office for them? Is it different than anywhere else? Uh, Yeah. And I guess often told. Yeah, and I guess I should clarify what I just said, too, because I, I just I know I just said it uh, sounded like I was probably speaking out of both sides of my mouth. I was making fun of the their Terrell Owens brand of relevancy uh, while saying that this current relevancy that we have, uh, it's different. So, you know, that's not, you know, there's different forms of it. You know, relevancy just because you're, uh, you have one player is a lot different than your team doing well and building something. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that the Bills fans have gotten tired of, you know, uh, being relevant because you signed Mario Williams and then nothing comes of it, uh, being relevant because you have Rex Ryan as your coach and nothing comes of it, uh, being relevant. Uh, uh, I don't know, because Donald Trump's trying to buy you, uh, and <laughs> thank God nothing comes of it. Although, although if he buys the bills, maybe he doesn't run for president. So depending <laughs> we, on where you we could have taken one for the team. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, there are different forms of it. But I do think that the players who are new here – I did a story for, uh, for the Athletic last, uh, last February uh, off of mostly the Pro Bowl and the players who were there who were free agents. You know, not, you know, these aren't all pros, and the Pro Bowl isn't what it used to be, but these still are the best players in the NFL. Um, and to talk to them about the stigma that Buffalo has – and that you do have to overpay to get guys like Mario Williams to convince them to come here. If you want to get into a bidding war, you're going to have to overpay uh, if you're Buffalo, not only because of the playoff uh, drought, uh, but you know, the, the things that the, the town has to offer. And as much as we love it and we know how great and somebody only uh, their only exposure to Buffalo is landing at the airport 
uh, driving up the 33, and then you can picture that in your mind, what you see to the <laughs> left or to the right when you the 33 to get to downtown hotel like the Hyatt or the Adams Mark. Yeah. And if anybody's ever stepped foot or had any, any friends who've stayed in those rooms, you know, this goes back to what Tom Brady said a few years ago about, you know, making fun of Buffalo's hotels. And, and Buffalo got upset. Like, oh, how can he say that about us? That asshole, Tom Brady. And the, the, how dare he make fun of our hotels? Well, guess what? The hotels at the time did suck. Yeah. And uh, he was right. And thankfully, they've since built a bunch of nicer hotels. But still, uh, it's uh, you have to imagine what these guys experience when they come and play a game against the Bills. They don't see much. And so it's all reputation of can't win, bad weather, um, taxes, and New York State taxes. So even the guys who come here, they do know what Buffalo's reputation is. All around the league, everybody knows, every, every ta- all 32 teams have a reputation. And it's not as though the Bills get overlooked by players in the league. So the guys who buy in here, they know what they're coming to. And that's why I think that they exhibit uh, an extra pride in here. Like they, hey, we're here. Whether they came via trade or uh, signed as free agents, Sean McDermott has gotten guys who are buying in. And and whether you think it's pandering or not, I happen to think it is a bit of pandering. But Josh Allen says all the right things about Western New York, and that's why so many fans love him. About making it a point to say there's only one New York team and talking about, you know, all the different things that Buffalo has to offer. And, uh, you know, so it, uh, yeah, I, I do think that these guys, even the new ones who didn't endure uh, that playoff skid. For- um, so, uh, Tim, just one last thing, you know, while you're here, um, you know, what do you expect from this game? It's uh, it's one of the, the highest uh, over-unders we've seen in the Bills game this year, 46 and a half. They are six and a half point. Uh, favorites. I know you you may not have time for your your normal show schedule tomorrow. I'm not sure if you'll be in town to to record your own show and have a uh, you know so, some of your friends that'll come on and uh, talk about the lines here. But do you expect a competitive game? Do you think they're going to come in and and be uh, with with the solid showing? I do expect a competitive game, and I've already reached out to my guy Joel Staniszewski. I won't have a show tomorrow. Well, show will will happen. But uh, Jonah Bronstein is going to guest host. I'll be calling in from Dallas because I I have an early flight tomorrow. But um, Joel's take is that the line is uh, too fat, that uh, he he thinks that the Bills are much more competitive than seven-point underdogs. And and this is true. And I know that this is a case from when I lived in Vegas uh, back when the Cowboys were really good. The Cowboys get a little bit of a pad against some teams just because they're the Cowboys. Yeah. So uh, and they're they're the they're America's team, right? And and uh, there are so many fans out there that bet with their heart that it can affect the spread because the spread so much of the time is about reputation, maybe more so than it is about a true um, matchup of X's and O's. But where I see this as being a problem for Buffalo is the Cleveland game, and that is really uh, the only time this season that Buffalo has faced serious offensive talent and now the Cleveland Browns were considered a team in crisis when the Bills went down there to play that game and a lot of people were thinking well Cleveland's on the verge of falling apart Buffalo shouldn't have any issue but Buffalo showed a problem on defense of matching up with Cleveland's talent and just player for player talent level star talent and I think that the Cowboys are in a similar situation they are a team in crisis perhaps this week Uh, The Bills are going to go on the road to face a team that has to win, uh, has a lot of pressure on them, and uh, try to close them out. But they have Amari Cooper. They have Ezekiel. And so they're going to have to find ways to cancel them out, and maybe they can, but then that leaves the door open for Randall Cobb. It leaves the door open for Michael Gallup. You know, it's there's just just enough guys out there uh, that the Bills have shown they can't cover them all. And if Levi Wallace can totally redeem himself from his performance against Cleveland, then I think the Bills win the game. So until I see the Bills actually do well defensively against talent, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to not buy in on that just yet. So hopefully they prove me wrong. But I, I think that Dallas could give, uh, could give the Browns the same uh, – the Bills uh, the same props as the Browns. 
I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And, and I think that Aaron and I kind of talked about many of the same things. Um, I, I appreciate Joel's advice uh, last week. He thought that the, uh, the line was one of the, the most off that he saw all season with Denver. Uh, I took his advice to heart and I, I profited from that information. So I, I appreciate uh, the, the information Joel shared last week. So <laughs> hopefully uh, we're, we're able to, to have something here. And, and again, I, I think that I, I want a competitive game. I obviously want the team to win, but I want a good showing. I want them to come out here and not be outclassed and to show that they are making genuine progress as a franchise because I, I know one of the things that I touched on before the perception comes from this will be the highest rated regular season game of the year last year's pro, uh, marquee game on Thanksgiving outrated the wild card playoff weekend and it was actually the most rate highest rated game uh, until you got to the divisional round of the playoffs. So that kind of attention and eyeballs is something Bills fans haven't had in a long time. And this team hasn't had in a long time. And I'm, I'm looking forward to them uh, being able to hopefully put their best foot forward. Yeah. I just want this team. I, I don't really care. I always had this one as a loss. I was just going to be a lot of eyes. Team to win. I don't really care. Just get two more wins. That's kind of where I'm at. We'll talk about that a little bit more as the show goes on here, but just get two more wins and have to beat this one. I just want to enjoy Thanksgiving. Just don't want the wheels to fall off in this game. And I think it could happen to the. All right. So now having a chance to kind of get some thoughts from, from someone like Tim and, and where we're at with this game. I know that we've talked a lot, you know, before the show and kind of ramping up for this to be able to kind of get our mind into what do we expect? And I know that, you know, I, I, I certainly agree with you that I, I kind of had this chalked up as a loss the entire time, but I will say there's a little bit more of a path now than what we've had previously. And that I think the, the potential to be able to get into this game with some of the flaws that Dallas has shown, um, they are the more talented roster. I, I think man for man, they have a lot of high end talent that we don't have at this point. Um, but I certainly think coaching has come up as an area that maybe can lean our way. And I think that our path to victory is more narrow. There's probably only one game script with us getting an early lead, being able to super similar to Denver, being able to have a long drawn out uh, drives to start the game, keep the ball out of their hands, get their defense tired get an early lead where we can pin our ears back and hope they need to pass more in the, in the second half, but we know what's coming. Um, I think there is a path to victory, but I don't know that I expect it to happen in the game. I don't expect it to happen in a game. I think really the only thing I care about is that this is a game that doesn't get totally out of control. If we go toe to toe with a team with the, as much talent as they have and the, the stuff that's brewing behind the scenes for the Cowboys could really go either way. They could galvanize around that and play for their coach and play peak football going into the playoffs. If they go on a little winning spree here or it could totally ruin their season. Those types of things in sports can go either way. I think there's a path for the bills to win. I think the, the probably the biggest impact on this is the short week. Uh, short week games are wacky Thursday night football in general over the last three, five years has been pretty bad football. It hasn't been, it's actually, uh, there's been a lot of articles written that the NFL should maybe pull it because it's a bad showcase for, you know, people are turning it off early. It hasn't been a good showcase when you get some bad teams up against each other. Both these teams have played bad at times this year. So this could be a really ugly game on a short week, but I think that that, kind of a game would favor the bills because I do think they are a more disciplined team. I think they're a team that kind of thrives in an ugly game environment, a uh, close game environment. So I think that that is the kind of thing that could favor the bills kind of coupled with what you said, the, the same type of strategy against Denver with maybe a little bit of an ugly game on a short week could really fall well for the bills. Uh, but again, I'm not expecting. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm curious where that's going to go. And I do think that the two areas that concern me is both Demarcus Lawrence and Robert Quinn and not being able to help both sides of the pass protection. And then whatever they do opposite Trey White. Now, in my mind, if Amari Cooper isn't 100% fresh, I almost wonder if we should lock up Tredavious White on Michael Gallup and then give Levi Wallace or Kevin Johnson, a little bit of extra safety help on Amari Cooper and almost go with the Belichick route where Belichick normally will take Gilmore and lock up the second best player and that double team, the best player. Um, I wouldn't mind something along those lines with a little creativity there, but those are the two areas that concern me on defense. It's having both pass rushers on, on each side. And then on offense, it's whoever's not being guarded by Tredavious white. And if they have a game plan for both of those things, I think we're okay. If either of them end up, you know, wrecking the game from a pass rush standpoint or getting loose in the secondary, I think it could get ugly. 
Yeah, no, I'm super worried about Josh Allen's health in this game because that that defensive front really can terrorize. It sounds like Woods, the defensive tackle, is out, and he's played pretty well this year, so I think that's a benefit uh, for the Bills in the run game, especially especially if Van Der Esch is, in fact, out. It sounds like he's going to be out for sure. Uh, if he's out, I think that's a real positive to try to take some of that pressure off Josh Allen, and they can't sack you if you don't run, if you don't pass that much. Uh, and also play off the, pay, the play action, which he's been successful with a little bit. So um, I'm a little worried about that with Josh. I'm not as worried about their pass game. I think that's the strength of the Bills defense. I, I, I think guys will make some plays. We're not going to shut them out. They're going to score points. I like the ability of Taron Johnson with Randall Cobb. I, I think that he, Randall Cobb has been a nice weapon for Dak Prescott at times this year. I, I feel pretty confident in that matchup. I feel great with Trey and Amari. Amari's probably going to get some catches. He might even get a touchdown, but I think Trey's going to do a good job on it. He's not going to blow the game apart. Uh, Gallup concerns me, but like you said, I think there's some things you can do. I don't know that there's a plan to stop Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, it looks like they're banged up a little bit along the, the their offensive line, so that may help us a little bit. But I don't think the Bills have fixed the run defense just because we held Denver to a, a, a small amount of total rushing yards, and you yeah. won that bet. Uh, you noted in that game that they, they still had five yards to carry for Philip Lindsay. He, they they probably could have produced more. And Ezekiel Elliott, I think, is better than Philip Lindsay. I think oh, yeah. he's a more dynamic guy. Uh, probably the most dynamic running back we've played this year next to Saquon Barkley. Those are the two top guys with Christian McCaffrey. So I see that as the the real frustrating thing for this game and a real chance for this Bills defense to prove that they've fixed that run defense because we haven't had to talk about it for two weeks. But I think that was more of a thing of the talent uh, that we were facing and the teams that we were facing uh, got kind of away from the run where I think Dallas is going to come in here and try to run the ball down the Bills' throats. And uh, they might be pretty successful at it, man. They're, they're a pretty good running team. Yeah, and it's certainly the offensive line that scares me more than Zeke himself. I think Zeke is a very good running back, very talented, but I'm much more afraid of, you know, that Tyron Smith and, and Zach Martin and Lyle Collins and just Travis Frederick and it, just having that level of talent on the offensive line is from the investment they made. You know, you're talking about, you know, five first round picks in, in six years. Um, that's what you get when you when you make that kind of investment and hit on every single pick. Um, it's you know pretty incredible to be able to put that together. Um, and it all depends on their health. Like you said, three of them have been um, you know regularly questionable here the last week or two. They're expected to all play, but it doesn't sound like they're at the the tip top of their game. Um, I know we had a couple questions in the in the chat here. Joe was mentioning about the run blitz and. Brian was talking about, are we getting better in-game adjustments? I think this is the example. I don't know that it's in-game adjustments. I think that some of the things we've seen are those cliche abstract terms that maybe everyone doesn't clearly understand with, you know, gap discipline and just tackling technique. One of 11. Yeah. Like those things, it really does matter. You know, the reason that we didn't give up any of the big runs that Philip Lindsay normally breaks is we made the tackle with the first guy who made contact every single time. There were almost no broken tackles. I think I remember one, he got about three extra yards off of it uh, because he was still stumbling. Um, and the, the same thing, Miami, obviously they just didn't have the talent to do that, but that's really where that's come from. That's harder to do when it's a six foot, 230 pound back, like Zico Elliott, who's harder to tackle. So if we still have that same gap discipline, we're still doing that one eleventh. everybody playing their role, not over penetrating, not having guys like an Ed Oliver or Jordan Phillips get excited and, and open up a gap because you thought you were going to make a play. And then guys that in the past haven't been perfect in their tackle and especially in the secondary, if we're starting to see more of that, then I think we could control this. If we do get out ahead of ourselves, open up some gaps, miss some tackles, that's where this could get ugly. And that's certainly what I want to avoid. I want to see a competitive game that represents the kind of team that the Bills have put together here and put their best foot for, best foot forward. And as long as we can maintain those things, I think we do have the talent to keep it close. Yeah, no, I, I think they do. And the, it's going to come down to, like I said, I think on a short week, neither team gets a extensive game plan against each other. I don't know who that hurts or impacts more, yeah. um, but I think you're going to probably see at times some sloppy football. I think this might be, you know, a, a two to three turnover game for the Buffalo Bills defense, which uh, they're probably going to need to win this game. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about the idea of the exact style that they've been using of offense with kind of going into that up tempo just because of how much talent is on the other side of the ball and how 
quickly. I think that the the Cowboys can score if we make mistakes or go three and out. Uh, when you're going up tempo, it's great when it's working and you're putting together 82 yard drives that take seven, eight minutes off the clock. That's fantastic. When you go three and out uh, very quickly, that is not great, especially when the other offense is Dak Prescott, Amari Cooper, all these names that we've been talking about. It's one thing to put the Broncos offense back out there, led by Brandon Allen. I feel pretty good that we'll get the ball back. Every time you give the Cowboys the ball, they have the chance to score. So I'm a little concerned in that no huddle up tempo. I think they, they got to use it at times. I don't know if that's going to be the primary method to say, Hey, we're going to attack this team with that all the time until uh, the lead gets so good that we can pull back like they did last week. I just don't know. They want to put that talent out there quickly. Um, if it's not clicking. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I don't think there's any, any point where we're going to have a lead that feels safe against a team like the Cowboys that they are a quick strike team with talent all over the field. We didn't even mention the name Randall Cobb, Jason Witten, you know, uh, Tony Pollard is a really explosive uh, rookie back that's complimenting Ezekiel Elliott. They have talent all over the place on this offense. And, you know, if we open up a gap anywhere, they can hit quick and be able to score on that. So um, I don't think that we're going to ever get into that cruising mode that we had with Denver. But I think that that idea, that model of the long sustained drives earlier than pinning our ears back on defense later with them getting tired on, on uh, defense because of all the snaps and leaning on them with the, the offensive line, that is our path to victory. It's just, can we execute to be able to make that realistic? So let, let's yeah. go ahead. Uh, I go don't through. think so. Yeah. If you want to go right into the predictions from there, I don't know. I don't feel like this week, that we can, and I have um, predicted it at a 20. I think the I agree with Tim that the line is a little fat. I had it at 24 20 uh, game, and I think that's right around where each team kind of has been scoring uh, for the most part this year. And I think it'll be a close game. I do think the Bills, it's kind of similar to the Cleveland game, will either have the lead in the fourth quarter or have the chance to take the lead in the fourth quarter. Um, and that to me, I, outside of a win is a, really the most ideal scenario is that you're in the game late. It's an entertaining game. You've gone toe to toe with the team with probably superior talent on paper. Um, and that proves to me that they can kind of hang with some of these other teams, go toe to toe with the Cowboys, like we, or, uh, with the Patriots, like we saw the Cowboys do just a week ago. And, uh, you, you can play with that upper echelon that, of teams that are better than you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's fair. I think that's right in the, the model of where, where we expect this. Um, I I'm in the same mindset and I, I've been torn. I really want to convince myself that, you know, the, the short week benefits us because Sean McDermott's so prepared and we're coming off a game plan that translates really well. So you don't need to pivot a ton, but there's a part of me that also says when it's a shorter game plan without as much specifics that maybe the talent outweighs more. Um, and, and I just, I, I think realistically it's something like 27, 24 Cowboys and that they're, they're probably going to be able to pull this out. I think the bills are going to be in this. I think they have a legitimate chance to win it. Um, I think that if we played 10 times, the bills probably win four of those and that there's a chance. One of them is on Thursday. Um, I do think the Cowboys are, are where we're trying to get towards and building that up and, and adding more elite talent, being able to develop some of the young players we have start to resend some of those guys and that maybe we're in a better position for this long term. But right now I, I do think the Cowboys can still pull this out. Um, and that, you know, it maybe if it was at home, I, I'd be picking the bills to be able to do the same. You'll be able to convince yourself by Thursday for sure. <laughs> You're, we're fans, and it's and that's one of the, like a little bit of the insight into this. Like we we pick this every week, and I I think I've only picked against the Bills twice yeah. uh, this year doing this, and it's not a homerism. I I really try to look at it objectively, and this week I just couldn't come there, and I, it was kind of the same as you. I was, I'm, as the fan in me, it's like the devil on your shoulder. And then the guy that's got to come on and do the show and the fan on my shoulder is like, come on, come on. It's a short week. We're going to win. We're going to, you know, <laughs> up the score. And it doesn't always work like that. Um, but by Thursday, you will have convinced yourself um, that this is going to be a, a dominating win and maybe a multiple score win. I promise you. Uh, obviously, uh, this is the only reasonable uh, conclusion here um, I, I, for to wrap things up here. How about uh, any of our bets that we had open here to, to go into the game? Well, we had one going into it, and we can make up more as we go here. But we had uh, <clears throat> Devin Singletary had his first 100-yard game last year. It was big news. Uh, we had it everywhere. I believe that I think Devin Singletary is going to follow that up with another 100-yard uh, rushing performance. I think that the opportunity is there. So I'm taking Devin Singletary, 99.5 yards. I'm taking over for three points. Uh, I got to build the lead back up on you, man. 
I know, I know. You let me sneak back into this here, and that's you know, shame on you. Yeah, you got to keep your your foot on the throat when you got a lead like you had. Fine. Um, there was another one that uh, I, I know we had out there with um, that you had put ideas up for uh, Dak Prescott's pass attempts with uh, thirty six and a half. W- w- which way did you feel on that one? Um, that's a big number, but he's he's gone over it a number of times this year. I'd take the over. Okay. Um, I don't really feel super confident either way, though. So if there's one way you feel confident, I'm I'm open to it. But uh, I, I'd probably take the over. No, I agree. I'll take the under, but let's do that one for two points since okay. that one's not a, a real confident one. Um, another one I was looking at was um, almost in the the logic with the idea for you know where the game plan is going to go i was going to ask who do you think is going to have more receiving yards amari cooper or michael gallup that's an interesting one i would i mean logic would tell me that gallup uh would uh but i'm going to throw a curveball out to you and say randall cobb Ooh, okay um what if we did – how about if we said it that um, – yeah, I'll, I'll take that Amari Cooper does, you take that Randall Cobb does, and, and then – Neither if, of us hit. Then, then hit if on your guy. Yeah, if it's Gallup, then it's a push. We'll, we'll take that one and dig it for, for What if it's points. Jason Witten? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if Jason Witten leads the Cowboys in receiving, the Bills Something's win. Something's gone wrong. Yeah, the Bills win. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, leading receiver. Or how many points are we doing that one? Uh, let's do that one for two as well. Yeah, okay. All right, and then we'll leave one more open um, for the guys that are listening here. Uh, shoot us some ideas. Send us, send them over via uh, the Twitter machine, and we'll, we'll come around there. Uh, speaking of which, where can the people find you, Aaron? <laughs> You can find me at Aaron Quinn, 716. Uh, Just having a lot of fun. This is a fun week for Bills fans. I think everybody's feeling good. There's a lot of positivity on Twitter. So let's try to keep that up. Uh, And and hopefully everybody enjoys their holiday and stays off of Twitter for, uh, you know, pretty much till kickoff. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again for our special guest tonight. It was awesome to be able to have somebody on like Tim Graham and, and being able to share, you know, just his insight and everything that he's done covering the team. Um, check him out on Twitter. I'm sure everyone listening here already follows him, but in case you're not, it's by at by Tim Graham, B Y T I M G R A A H A M. Um, obviously lots of great stuff coming out from the athletic. If you haven't had a chance yet, they did an awesome oral history on the snover time game uh, with the Colts. That was really, really, entertaining uh, and a bunch of other cool stuff that's come out recently so make sure to check out his work you can find me on twitter at greg thompson g-r-e-g-t-o-m-p-s-e-t-t make sure give me a follow have a lot of fun here really hope that we have a competitive game really love to see a bills win if we do man is that going to be a a fun long break heading into the ravens game so uh certainly wishing for that any final uh thoughts for the team here well actually i hadn't really even thought about the long break we need to win. I can't do 10 days of fighting with Bills fans about it, them losing that game and the overreaction. So for my own mental state and sanity, please, football gods, let the Bills win this game so I don't have to deal with 10-day uh, turnaround without a game. Uh, so I'm, I'm calling in a favor. No, I, I agree. I agree. We need this. And man, that'll be a fun 10 days to bask in that glory. So yeah. every, everybody uh, hoping their awesome job in the chat tonight, guys. Thank you for all the help. Appreciate everything that's going on. Um, enjoy what's happening here. Happy Thanksgiving and everybody that's listening. Hope you enjoy time with family and friends and then hunker on down and watch the bills. Hopefully pull out a victory. You've been listening to cover one Buffalo and we are out. 